Okay, we're on episode two here of Joseph H. Jackson in Nauvoo, discovering the secret abominations practiced by Joseph Smith with the spiritual wife system, the Danites, and the Council of Fifty. So here we go. Sometime in November, I was helping a bit to haul some goods from the river that belonged to Messrs. Rollison and Finch. I was in company with Mr. Finch and a man from Keokuk, who was owner of the horses and wagon. We had hauled one load and were returning for the second. As we crossed the bottom between the temple and the river, a man standing at about eight rods distance, it being after dark, called me by name. I immediately jumped from the wagon, thinking that it was a man who wished me to get some goods stored that had called me. Finch immediately followed. When I got within about five feet of the villain, as he proved to be, he extended his arm at full length and said, Damn you, I give you what you deserve, and fired a pistol. The ball passed my head and so stunned me that for a few minutes I scarcely knew what I was about. But on coming to, I could scarcely see, for, the fa for my face and eyes were so burned with powder. Finch, at the time the shot was fired, was about one rod behind. He, seeing me stagger, immediately pursued the fellow, but soon found that he was no match for him in speed, and gave up the pursuit. Finch and myself agreed to keep this matter a secret, that we might be able to discover some clue to the assassin. I thought that we did not mention it. I thought that if we did not mention it, and heard it from others, of it from others, we would be able to trace the matter to its fountainhead. When, however, this idea became hopeless, I mentioned it to my friends, who seemed to understand the object of the maneuver. Shortly after this, I left Nauvoo and went to Carthage to spend the winter. During the winter, I employed my time in hunting, but I heard frequently complaints against the thieving Mormons. In the spring, I determined to find out whether Joe Smith was in reality a bad man, as he was represented as bad a man, and whether he had in reality instigated the villain who attempted in my life in Nauvoo. I therefore stated to, to Harmon T. Wilson, Deputy Sheriff, that I intended to visit Nauvoo, and if any man could, I would find out Joe Smith's plans and measures and at a proper time, if I found him to be as base and represented as I believed him to be, disclose all to the world. In forming this resolution, I was actuated by a desire, on the one hand, to revenge myself on him if he were guilty of the attempt on my life, and by at, and by at romantic love of adventure on the other. I possessed every advantage in person and countenance to accomplish my object, as well as a full share of experience in the ways of the world. Accordingly, in the month of March, I went to Nauvoo, and after I, after I staying there a few days, I visited Joe and gave him to understand that I had important business with him. He invited me into his private room, and there, in the presence of Heber Kimball, I discussed the nature of my business, and made him believe that I could be of great service to him. I stated that I was a fugitive from Mason County, Georgia, and wanted protection. This seemed to tickle his fancy wonderfully, and throwing off restraint, he saw that I was just the man he wanted, and referred me to the conduct of Joab unto David. He then said that he would make any man rich who would be unto him as was Joab to David and obey his commands in the name of God that he might fulfill his prophecies. He then commenced an argument to make me believe that he was right and lawful in the sight of God and declared himself a godly man and a prophet endowed with power from on high. I then remarked that as to his religion I cared nothing about it for I did not believe in the supremacy of God. Here he looked me steadfastly and significantly in the eye, but I flinched not. I then told him that I was a desperate man and could release Porter Rockwell, who was at that time confined in prison in Missouri for his attempt on the life of Governor Boggs. 
Well, said he, if you will release Porter and kill old Boggs, I will give you $3,000. Kimball heard this conversation throughout, but I have no hope that he could be made to acknowledge its truth. So deeply is he leagued with Joe in his villainy. Joe, after this offer, made a proposition to give me an outfit to Missouri and said that he would soon furnish me with a splendid horse, saddle, bridle, and all the necessary accoutrements for the journey. To all this, Kimball assented. The second morning after this, I met Joe again. He told me he had traded a town lot with Elder Grant for a splendid black horse and also that he had procured a saddle and a bridle for the trip. Now, said he, go and perform in the name of God, and let the little fellow out of jail, for my heart bleeds for him. I took possession that day of the horse, saddled and bridled, and the next day Joe brought to my boarding house a pair of saddle bags, concealed under his cloak. This expedition was kept a profound secret. People in general supposed that I had bought the horse of Joe, and had no idea that there was any understanding between us. After having this horse in my possession for two or three days, Joe and I took a ride up to Edward Hunter's, where he borrowed $100, and I drew his note for it on demand. Hunter at this time was absent. While there, Mrs. Hunter brought the Bible to Joe and wished him to explain some passage in the third chapter of Hosea in relation to the adulteress. He replied that he would call at another time and translate it for her, for which she thanked him kindly. After this, I learned that the scripture named by Mrs. Hunter was one of the proofs of the correctness of the spiritual life doctrine, of which the reader will learn more hereafter. After conversing a little while, we arose to depart, and Joe gave Mrs. Hunter a very sanctimonious blessing. We then got on our horses and rode up the hill where we were met by the holy patriarch, Hiram, on his white horse. He informed Joe that brother somebody, I do not recollect the name, was sick, and that they were sent for to lay hands on him, for he was sick unto death. I rode to the G house, I rode to the house, misprint I think, of the invalid with them. We entered the room, and I put on a very grave countenance, while they both laid hands on the sick man, and Hiram made a long sanctimonious prayer. As we left the house, Joe pronounced a blessing on it, and all that were within. We then again mounted our horses. Hiram went home, and Joe and I took a ride for some five miles on the prairie. All the way out and back, he pressed me to kill Boggs, and said that he would pay me well for it. Finally, I gave him a strong hint that I was in for the business, knowing as I did that if I hesitated, he would suspect me of treachery, and thus all my plans in relation to him would be frustrated. I therefore carried on my game by showing a bold front. All the while he was urging the killing of Boggs, he insisted that it was the will of God, and in God's name he ordered me, offered me a reward for his blood. This was all done with an air of sanctimonious gravity and with a look of innocence that would make one almost believe that the prophet really thought that he was acting under the command of heaven. I was utterly astonished to see this man concoct the most hellish plans for murder and revenge and yet with pertinacity insist that it was right in the sight of God. And here, if I may be permitted to pause, lay the whole secret of Joe Smith's success. He had a singularly unmeaning countenance that was no index of his real character. He had so long practiced duplicity that there was scarcely a compunctious feeling left in his bosom, and he had no scruples in regard to the means that he should employ when he had an end to attain. Hence it was that he had no hesitancy in prostituting everything sacred for the purpose of lust cupidity, revenge, or power. The next morning after this adventure, I took my departure for Missouri. The weather was very bad, the streams high, and I suffered very much with the, vet, with, with the wet and cold. After a journey of eight days, I arrived at Independence, 
where I put up with a Mr. N Knowlton. At this time, the, the Chavis murderers were arrested, and I saw them in the custody of the sheriff while on their way to the jail. While these men were being put into the prison, I entered it for the purpose of seeing Rockwell, and that I might give a straight account of myself, I found him with a pair of shackles on and a loinskin overcoat. Looked rather uncouth. There were, however, so many in prison at this time that I had no opportunity to converse with him. My hope was that by representing myself as being in the employ of Joe and convincing him of the fact to draw from him a confession that he, that might be useful for the purposes which Harmon T. Wilson and myself had in view. Previous to my leaving Carthage for Nauvoo, I had learned from Harmon T. Wilson that he was in correspondence with Mr. Reynolds, Sheriff of Jackson County, Missouri, in relation to another demand from the Governor of Missouri for Joe Smith. An arrangement had been entered into that a requisition should be made on the return of Mr. Wilson for, from a trip which he contemplated <laughs> to take to the south, immediately on the opening of navigation. Had I thought at the time I left Mr. Wilson of this trip to Missouri, I should have brought a letter from him to Mr. Reynolds, which would have disclosed to the latter my true character. As matters, however, were, I found myself placed in a situation where I could do no good towards the great object I had in view. There was great excitement in independence, in consequence of the Chavez murders, many per persons were arriving to join the Oregon emigrating expedition, and every stranger appeared to be looked on with distrust and suspicion. Mr. Reynolds was so busily engaged in arresting the Chavez murderers that I could get no opportunity to make his acquaintance and fix upon a concerted plan of operations in relation to Smith. Seeing the impossibility of effecting what I desired, and having no idea of attempting what Joe sent me for, I resolved to return to Nauvoo. Okay, well from here we'll be taking it to video three in the series on Joseph Jackson revealing the abominations committed in Nauvoo under Joseph Smith, the Danites, and the spiritual life system. Get the next video into the channel next to the subscribe button on the channel button for the Mormon Truth Video Library in the Dodger Game channel.